Welcome to the Kotke Ride Home for Tuesday, January 12th, 2021. I'm Jackson Bird. The 16th century manual on containing the spread of disease that is eerily reminiscent of current COVID guidelines. Bitcoin millionaires who can't access their digital wallets due to forgotten passwords. And the guy whose massive beer collection is playing an important role in archaeological studies. Here are some of the cool things from the news today. So this was a quick link on Kaki.org that I found fascinating. It's a 16th century pamphlet with medical advice for controlling epidemics that's eerily prescient, for the most part. So in the late 1500s, the port city of Alguero, Sardinia, was hit with the plague, thanks to an infected sailor traveling from Marseille. While the outbreak was absolutely devastating to Alguero, killing about 60% of its population by modern estimates, what's unique is that it was completely contained within the city borders, barely spreading to nearby regions, and it was eradicated in just eight months. And that is largely thanks to the work of Quinto Tiberio Angelirio, an upper-class doctor. Having recently spent time in Sicily during a plague outbreak there, he had a few ideas about how to control the spread. His proposals faced backlash at every level at first, but as the plague continued to take its toll on the community, he was eventually allowed to implement various measures, and they worked. Towards the end of his life, he collected his mostly successful measures in a booklet recounting how they had worked in Sardinia, and when Alguero faced another outbreak, which didn't happen for another 60 years, I might add, officials immediately turned to Angelirio's manual. So what sort of things were in the manual? Quarantining, of course. There was a triple sanitary cordon around the city walls to prevent trade, and within the city walls, residents were encouraged to stay at home. Though no one liked them and the rules were frequently broken and rule breakers penalized with jail time, lockdowns were common throughout Italy in times of plague. In fact, the word quarantine comes from the Italian for quaranta giorni, which means 40 days, because if a household member were suspected of having the plague, everyone in the household was supposed to quarantine at home for 40 days. And remember at the start of this pandemic when we were all disinfecting our mail and groceries? Well, turns out Angelirio was hyping that in the 16th century. He encouraged people to, quote, disinfect, whitewash, ventilate, and water their houses. He explained that any objects that aren't particularly valuable should be burned, while expensive furniture can be washed, exposed to the wind, or disinfected in an oven instead, end quote. This was rooted in an idea at the time of bad air, that is, that diseases passed through bad air and could contaminate objects that had been in this bad air. Alex Bomji, a social and cultural historian at the University of Leeds, points out that some artifacts from early modern Europe still bear the scorch marks from people sanitizing them with smoke and fire. And going along a bit with this bad air thing, another measure proposed by Angelirio was physical distancing. Specifically, and this is kind of wild, that people keep a distance of six feet from each other. Here's a translated quote from the manual. People allowed to go out must bear with them a cane measuring six feet long. It is mandatory that people keep this distance from one another. End quote. The BBC notes that none of the other experts they spoke with had heard of this specific measure being encouraged by others at the time, so Angelirio was really ahead of his time. Can you imagine if we had to carry canes nowadays to make sure that we were keeping six feet of distance? I mean, apart from the inevitable whacking of each other on accident and on purpose, I'm not totally against the idea. Now, Angelirio also advocated for adding rails to counters at shops so people could keep the appropriate distance from workers, and he seemed to have an idea about immunity, even though that concept wouldn't really come into play until long after he was gone, as he ordered that certain tasks, like digging the graves of those who had succumbed to the plague, be carried out by people who had already had the plague and survived it. Of course, Angelirio couldn't get everything right. He also encouraged people to be on their best behavior because the plague was divine punishment. And he recommended all cats and turkeys be killed and thrown into the sea. 
Apparently, a lot of towns in Europe ordered the slaughter of various animals, especially cats and dogs, which, you know, may have actually done more harm than good since rats were known carriers of the plague and the cats could have helped kill the rats. Some towns cottoned onto this and tried killing the rats as well, but not Alguero. Still, after the initial tragedy, the city managed to mitigate the spread of the plague thanks to some very prescient prevention ideas that we're shockingly still employing today. I don't know what 2021 will bring, but I do know that I want to keep learning and creating cool stuff no matter what. And a great way to do that affordably and without even needing to leave my house is with one of today's sponsors, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for creatives, where millions come together to take the next step in their creative journey. They offer thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people on topics including photography, music production, web development, productivity, creative writing, freelancing, and more. I am a huge fan of Roxanne Gay, so I was stoked to see that she taught a class on Skillshare share called Creative Writing, Crafting Personal Essays with Impact. I have learned so much over the years from reading her writing, but listening to her explain the craft firsthand was awesome. And that's one of the great things about Skillshare. You feel a real sense of community and kinship with fellow creatives that, for me at least, inspires me to keep exploring and creating. And not only will Skillshare empower you to accomplish real growth, but it's incredibly affordable to boot, especially when compared to pricey in-person classes and workshops. An annual subscription Subscription is less than $10 a month. And for listeners of the Kotki Ride Home, you can explore your creativity at Skillshare.com slash Kotki and get a free trial of premium membership. Again, that's Skillshare.com slash Kotki for a free trial of premium membership. With the way my lifestyle changed in 2020, I realized I needed to make staying fit a bigger priority. I wasn't getting my usual activity in naturally from running errands and commuting around the city, so it became extra important to make time for intentional activity. And that's what I'm focusing on in 2021, setting aside more time to be active and push myself physically. Whether you're also looking to add more exercising to your 2021 schedule or have other activity goals, FitBod can create a personalized fitness program that continues adapts to you. FitBod takes the intimidation and guesswork out of finding what works for you by learning your abilities and building a dynamic program that adjusts as you go. It's awesome watching the app adjust workouts the more that I do, letting me know when my muscles have recovered, and letting me customize settings based on the equipment I have available at home. I don't have to adapt anything. I can just open the app and go. The FitBod understands that the path to achieving your best looks different for everyone, which is why their algorithm uses data and analytics analytics to help you build on your last workout to maximize your results. It's super easy to use with HD video tutorials to reference for any exercises you may not have encountered before, and it syncs with apps like Apple Health, Fitbit, and Strava. So get your body out of hibernation and start the year off stronger than ever with FitBod. You can get 25% off a membership when you sign up now through February 28th at fitbod.me slash kotki. That's 25% off your membership at fitbod.me slash kotki. Bitcoin hit a record high last Thursday of over $40,000. It had a huge drop on Monday, but is now back up to $36,000 as of recording on Tuesday. The volatile currency is making a lot of people very rich, but one problem is emerging. A lot of those people can't access the keys to their accounts because they forgot the passwords. And it sounds kind of funny at first, but it is a bit more complicated than simply forgetting your Twitter password and having to be emailed a link to create a new one. The first complication is that there's no one central company that you could contact for the password. You you can't just call Bank of America to reopen your account. Quoting the New York Times, The virtual currency's creator, a shadowy figure known as Satoshi Nakamoto, has said that Bitcoin's central idea was to allow anyone in the world to open a digital bank account and hold the money in a way that no government could prevent or regulate. This is made possible by the structure of Bitcoin, which is governed by a network of computers that agreed to follow software containing all the rules for the cryptocurrency. The software includes a complex algorithm that makes it possible to create an address and associated private key, which is known only by the person who created the wallet. 
The software also allows the Bitcoin network to confirm the accuracy of the password to allow transactions without seeing or knowing the password itself. In short, the system makes it possible for anyone to create a Bitcoin wallet without having to register with a financial institution or go through any sort of identity check." End quote. Sounds great in theory, depending on the type of person you are and your goals, but one problem is that it doesn't really account for just how bad people are at remembering passwords, especially those who bought Bitcoin years ago. The Times profiles a number of people who bought or were gifted Bitcoin in its early days and have long since lost the hard drives or pieces of paper where they stored their passwords. Yes, actual pieces of paper in many cases. And some of those encrypted drives only allow you a certain amount of wrong password guesses ever, and then the drive encrypts forever and you're out of luck. These people have had to watch Bitcoin plummet and soar over the years, being unable to access the money. Some Bitcoin investors turn to outside companies to hold their Bitcoin or provide security, but even some of the biggest companies of that sort have seen private keys stolen or lost. Quoting again, of the existing 18.5 million Bitcoin, around 20%, currently worth around $140 billion, appear to be in lost or otherwise stranded wallets, according to the cryptocurrency data firm Chainalysis. Wallet Recovery Services, a business that helps find lost digital keys, said it had gotten 70 requests a day from people who want help recovering their riches, three times the number of a month ago. End quote. And while some people may be totally out of luck, the Times points out that some of the people who have had to watch, for example, 800 bitcoins bought in 2011, now worth $25 million, be lost to accidents like a reformatted laptop, did have other stores of bitcoin and have successfully made even more money than what they've lost, so don't feel too bad for them. Stefan Thomas, a programmer who lost the digital keys to the wallet containing the first bitcoins he was given, but has since made back tons of money from other bitcoin investments, said that he no longer believes as much in the idea of people being their own banks. He said, quote, Let me put it this way. Do you make your own shoes? The reason we have banks is that we don't want to deal with all those things that banks do. End quote. David Maxwell, a lecturer on prehistoric societies at Simon Fraser University in British Columbia, is one of the world's most avid collectors of beer cans. And not like frat bros who save every can of beer or handle of liquor they drink. He collects old cans of beer, going back as far as the 1930s when they were first introduced in the U.S. He scours the sides of highways where decades of 20th century litter have built up, and at his height, he had collected over 4,500 discarded cans of beer, though he has downsized to just over 1,000 for storage reasons. And it's not just an idle hobby. Maxwell has become something of a scholar of beer cans, providing assistance to archaeologists on dating found cans. Quoting Atlas Obscura, when canned beer was first introduced in 1935, the ease of littering cans, in contrast to refillable glass bottles that customers returned for five-cent refunds, was a major selling point. You throw the cans away when you're through with them, wrote The Evening Sun on August 5, 1935. Over Zoom from his house in British Columbia, Maxwell shows me the back of a Rainier beer can from 1938. You've got this little panel on the back telling you, no returning necessary, throw away when empty, he says, which is a godsend for collectors and archaeologists. End quote. In addition to providing one-on-one -on -one consults for the inquiring archaeologist, Maxwell also wrote a field identification guide in the early 90s that outlines the evolution of beer can shapes and features. Quoting again, if you can read the label, one of the first things to look for is whether or not it says internal revenue tax paid on it, says Maxwell. All beer cans manufactured between June 1, 1935 and March 30, 1950 contain this statement, except for those designated for military use during World War II. If the label is gone, he looks at features like the size and shape of a can's punch hole. Over time, so-called flat-top cans got lighter and thinner, and so did the church keys used to open them, until the invention of pull tabs in 1962." End quote. 
Knowing the date of a beer can can help archaeologists date a site and infer other details about behavior and time period. And it's not just academics. Quote, in 1997, Maxwell was hired to assess a U.S. Air Force base in California, which was believed to have been unoccupied before World War II. During his survey, though, Maxwell discovered a pile of beer cans from the 1930s. Although too rusted to read, the flat tops had large punch holes, and the cone top cans all had low profiles, rather than the longer, high profile neck that appeared after World War II, both of which indicate a presence at the site prior to 1942. End quote. Trash in general is a godsend for archaeologists. It can tell us so much about people who lived in a place before us. But Atlas Obscura points out that most archaeologists don't focus just on the evolution and details of one specific object. And that's why collectors like Maxwell are so useful to them. You need someone with unlimited enthusiasm for the item they're collecting to be able to devote the time required to become an expert on it. So eccentric or pointless as it may seem to some, Maxwell's collection is incredibly valuable. And while we definitely need to limit our material waste going forward, at least what's already out there can provide valuable insights about our past. That is it for today. As always, this show was produced by Ride Home Media and Kotke.org. I am Jackson Bird, and I'm going to go pick up a six-foot staff to start carrying around to prevent people from entering my social distancing bubble. I hope you have a great rest of your day, and I'll talk to you again tomorrow. 